Today, our interviewee for the Apex is Rob Hubbard, Director and Head of Department at Bonhams MPH. And we're going to talk a bit about how he got into the automotive world, some of the fascinating cars and collections he has handled over the years at Bonhams, his current thoughts on the auction world, and the potential impacts of the dreaded coronavirus. Rob, thank you so much for joining us, and let's begin. So, how did you first get involved in the historic motoring world, and what are the origins of your particular passion for pre war cars? Uh, well, my um, uh, interest uh, in the, the silly old car world that we find ourselves in um, started uh, many moons ago when uh, I fell out of the catering trade um, and into the event management world. Um, and I stumbled across a job with the Vintage Sports Car Club, um, organising the, the fabulous events that they did, which were at the time then pre C Red days, um, when uh, they had their their festivals up at Donington um, before anybody had even thought of doing those sort of events. Um, and I started there with them on a summer placement. Um, that then turned into a full-time job uh, with the FCC, uh, running the competitions department along with Bob Wimmer for many years. Um, and yeah, that was really how I cut my teeth uh, with the old car world. Um, at the time, and, and as we do now still, Bonhams um, support the, the Vintage Sports Car Club um, as Premier Associates with them. And they, uh, they asked me if I fancied coming on and joining the team um, with some pre-war car knowledge. And that was then how I ended up in the auctioneering world. So it, it was never really a, a, a fixed career path. Um, it was uh, just following my interest in the old car game, um, which which has turned into a full time job, and as you say, now running this uh, development system. Fantastic. And since joining Bonhams in, I think it was two thousand and eight, you've achieved many record breaking auction results and handled numerous collections. Uh, has there been a particular car or collection you've handled that has stood out for you, and, and why? Uh, it's hard really to to pinpoint one or two. You know, I've, I've been very lucky uh, in my career to, as you say, I've handled many, uh, many collections and um, um, team world records, so, you know, quite a lot of which still stand. Um, but I think probably my particular favourite is uh, we sold the 1922 um, Sunbeam um, Strasbourg Grand Prix car, um, and that was uh, just an absolutely fabulous time warp piece that uh, the Gear Brothers had owned for many, many years. Um, and it, it was a, a car that was in hugely original order, um, featured that fantastic two litre, um, amazing engine that those cars had, and uh, the two seater formula with the rear wheel. And it, it was one of the three works team cars that that some been made um and that was then bought um by Erez Yardini who who still has the car now and um it is great that actually it, it went to somebody who was so passionate about the old car world um and and Erez uh, along with his other um Grand Prix Sunbeam um has has got that car up and, and running now which uh, it hadn't been on the road for many years it was um mothballed whilst was in the gears care um, but that really was a just such a stunning piece of a car. You you really don't come across things like that every day of the week. Fantastic. I guess it's important that uh, these cars go to the right custodians, particularly ones with such historic importance as the Sunbeam uh, you you mentioned. And I know that Bottoms, you, you've got a very good network for, for doing that. And um, I know one of the other great finds which you had was i believe back in 2015 when you came across a, a, a barn or got contacted by uh, i think it was a lady actually um who had a, a 1929 bentley four and a half liter uh, in her barn uh, i think it spent 30 years there and i believe she thought it was only worth like thirty thousand pounds or so yeah, what, what, can you tell us the story about that, that an incredible find yeah, sure. It, it, it was one of those, it, and quite a lot of the things in our world happen this way, that um, our, our names and, and numbers are passed around and we're recommended to, to various friends or what have you. And I still to this day don't know who passed the lady my telephone number, um, but I'm very glad they did because she she telephoned me and said that they had a, a 1934 Bentley that belonged to her father. Um, it had been in the garage rotting for a number of years. And, and while she wasn't sure it was something maybe Bonhams could handle, um, it was certainly something that she needed some advice on. Um, so I, I said, 
was all head down and see you in Epsom, not not an issue. And when I got there to open the garage doors, um, I was confronted with the unmistakable nickel radiator of a four and a half litre Bentley. Um, and I was I was somewhat taken aback because I was expecting to see a chrome Derby Bentley stood in front of me. Um, and because I was slightly silent, she was full of apology, thought that I'd, uh, she'd wasted my time travelling uh, an hour in the car to come and see her. And she said, oh, I'm ever so sorry. I knew I should have called the scrap man. It, it, the car should have just gone. I'm so sorry. And uh, I had to then reassure her that actually, no, it was just purely because this was such a fantastic car and it was one that had been off the radar for a number of years um and that was a completely original matching numbers four and a half litre bentley saloon um that had been in their family since 1931 i think from memory um her grand sorry her father bought it in in 1920 1931 um as an 18 month old motor car and they they only took it off the road in 1981 because he found the petrol too expensive uh so started driving a nissan micro um <laughs> hero to zero <laughs> um, and but, but thankfully you know, whilst the garage was uh, was pretty useless it was actually quite dry and there was a good through flow of air um and we we pulled the bentley out of the garage that afternoon um behind it she didn't even know there was a, a 1912 napier and behind that an austin 7 saloon um and it was the austin 7 that was holding the garage up so we we had to put some macro props in uh into the garage frame extracted the three cars um and then took took them away but as you say she was expecting it to be worth very little and when i told her i thought we should put a, a good lean keen estimate of 150 to 200,000 on the car she was quite surprised but delighted um and then when I sold the car at Bewley, uh, as you, you rightly said, I finally ended up dropping the hammer and, and we sold the car for 695000 which still to this day is a record for an unrestored uh, four and a half litre Bentley saloon. Um, and it's, again, went into a very, very good um, home. He did such a minimal amount of work to it um, to get it running and driving. And uh, it remains as it was then, so original and, and, and well-maintained now. Fantastic. What, a, what an incredible story. I'm sure there are lots of people, having read that story uh, back in 2015, they hear about it, you know, going to their grandparents and then scooping, snooping around their garages just in case. <laughs> well, um, we're, we're quite lucky in that it's, it's only really been a lifetime ago. Um, and there are still cars coming out, and a lot of people say that it's drying up, and, and of course it's getting uh, more scarce, but actually it's not that long ago that these, these cars were, were produced, you know, we're only talking 100 years, um, so there are still many out there, I'm sure, which are yet to be discovered, and obviously we, we all hope and dream to, to find these things again. I quite agree. And then moving on, last year you launched Bonham's MPH, a new department at Bonham's based at Vista Heritage. Uh, what are the aims of MPH and how is it different from the, the usual Bonham's motoring department? Um, well, we'd, uh, over the last four or five years, um, we'd refined the, the main Bonham's car department to such an extent that we found ourselves turning away a huge amount of custom um, and letting other competitors in the marketplace um, have, have a bit more hand on, on the market than what they necessarily should have. Um, so we decided that actually the, the collection or collecting goals now achieve 80s and 90s cars as well as as many others um and that was an area that we should focus on because that that was a, a an area that was growing and there was huge interest so we we launched as you say the mph um division modern popular and historic you know, the idea behind the mph um strap line and uh, yes we we now cater for um pretty much anything and everything um under the bonhams umbrella uh but the the mph brand uh takes particular care of um pure classics um modern and uh historic motor cars as well um and that's we introduced a, a good number of new online um, elements, streamlining the processes and, and cutting our cloth accordingly. You know, we, we only charge half uh, up there to sell your motor car as we would uh, at our traditional London sales. So we, whilst we streamline the process, we handed those savings on to the, the customers. Um, and it's proved exceptionally successful. We've, we've had 
four auctions um, in in the last uh, eight months. Um, the market's reacted very, very well, and and we continue to to go from strength to strength at uh, at the Bester office. Fantastic, and, and I know obviously you mentioned the modern classics there, and that's a particular area of cars where I think a lot of younger people are getting interested. And in. certainly, you know, I'm in my early thirties. A lot of my contemporaries are ringing me up saying, "Yeah, you know, I want a sort of modern classic. What do you recommend?" Yeah, have you have you actually seen that in the the bidders that you've been getting through? Are they a slightly dem- different demographic to the usual bottom sales? Yeah, they're very much uh, where traditionally um, we would sell to a similar group of, of, of bidders. Um, we find that the majority of our buyers at MPH are new to us at, at most sales. Um, and, and that's great because we're spreading the Bonham's message out there. But you find that, like, like you were saying, really, um, those people in their early to mid 30s or slightly into their 40s, um, they've now got a bit of disposable income. And they're thinking back to those cars that maybe their parents had when they were growing up as children or the, the early pinup cars that, that we all remember. Um, and I think there's a, there's a in modern society now, we're, we're all trained so much to be on comparison this and, and um, swapping your business elsewhere. Actually, to, to instill some brand loyalty into people um, is, is really my aim and and um when somebody does buy that one car from us because that's all they either want or can afford at this moment in time i hope they'll then come back to us when they want to upgrade that car um and give us an opportunity to sell it for them and and then they can buy another one from us and become part of the mph club um but but definitely those cars are really starting to, uh, to gain traction Interesting, and very sensible. And you know, given the current coronavirus pandemic, classic car auction companies, obviously including Bottoms, have had to adapt their auction formats to ensure that the viewings and so on are carried out in a safe manner. Uh, I know that Bottoms conducted a sale last weekend in this new format, which achieved some really good results. In fact, I had a nose around. There were quite a few cars which I was interested in, but sadly didn't get around to, to bidding or have, or have the funds to at the time. But uh, how has COVID-19 changed classic car? auctions and do you think it has impacted classic car values generally well there's no two ways about it it's it's definitely affected everything that we do um and this uh, new normal that everybody is sort of talking of um is, is coming into force and we, we were quite lucky that we were we were ahead of the game um two or three years ago when uh, we launched our own online bidding platform so we weren't reliant upon the other uh, third party sites which all the other auction houses were and that's that made us one step ahead um by already having a lot of the technologies in place to do these solely online auctions um so so from that point of view we've we've just enhanced um that experience we are now doing more video content for people who can't come and view uh, if they are shielding or um in lockdown and what have you so and uh, people are, are more used to buying things online currently. Um, I think we've all uh, had to resort to doing some online shopping for either basic groceries or from Amazon or various other online retailers. And it's people are more trusting of an online sale process now. Um, but who really knows what's going to happen going forward? I, I think there's a huge desire amongst all of us to go back to a traditional auction, um, go and see our friends, go and kick the tires, go and hear it run and, and talk nonsense to one another and, and ultimately enjoy that um, wonderful feeling of when the auction is actually happening and, and enjoy all that process that we all love so much. Um, and I hope that that will return, but I don't think that's going to be any time soon, if I'm honest. I think we're, we're certainly in for this new format, certainly for the rest of 2020 uh, and maybe into a, a bit of early next year. Um, but as you say, uh, prices are slightly down. Uh, yes, I agree with you on that. Um, you, you can't you can't roll that one in glitter. That That is the fact. Um, but what is encouraging, uh, like you say, our sale we had last Saturday, um, we sold 80 percent of the cars that we offered in that sale. And whilst the prices were slightly down on where we were pre um, coronavirus, um, to sell 80 percent in this marketplace shows that there is not only strength in the market, but also a desire to own uh, an asset where we've seen the um, the FTSE falling and various other money markets falling. People are looking to invest back in asset form again. Um, so we're seeing interest in motor cars and motorcycles uh, rising, which which is great news. 
Yep. No, I, I agree with that. And I've, I've, I've bought a few. I think out of boredom as well. I've bought a couple of cars online because uh, being <laughs> cooped up. But there we go. And um, and I, you know, over obviously the last few years, I've been very lucky to have joined you in a number of number of times as a bouncer in your glorious 1924 Vauxhall 1398 during the the VSEC trials. Uh, I know you've been building it for a very long time, but maybe you could tell a little bit about the story behind your your 1398 Vauxhall. Yeah, sure. Well, it's um, I, I've like you say I, I I've been involved in the SEC for a number of years, and um, uh, Julian Ghost, good good friend of mine, um, convinced me that actually I, I shouldn't be messing around with these silly Riley's and all things. I really needed a proper motor car, uh, and and that was a Vauxhall. So uh, he he duly sold me a kit, <laughs> and over the the, the next on for twelve years, by the time I actually finished putting everything together and finishing it off. Um, that, that we then restored the 1398 um, to its, its form that it is now. Um, and there was a huge amount of work that went in over that time and, and sourcing parts uh, from all over the world. And, and um, Julian is very good with the, the new component parts in, in terms of the engine, gearbox, and axle and all those sort of things. Um, and uh, the, the body design is, is something I came up with on, on the back of a fag packet one evening. Um, to, to look similar to uh, the Valux body, uh, but also using the, the Wensum wings, which uh, I, I think are far more handsome. And, and I know I'm biased, but it's, it's resulted in a hell of a good looking car um, and also one that's, uh, that's very potent. You know, as you know, from coming out with us, it's it's a comfortable 80 mile an hour cruiser on the road. Um, and yet we can go and clear a, a, a mud plugging trial section um, with literally no modification to the car in betwixt the two. So it's uh, it's a hell of a good thing. I couldn't agree more. Um, and I, I guess a lot of people who, who aren't familiar with pre-war Vauxhalls, they associate it with the post-GM purchase cars. Whereas back in the day, uh, the 1398 Vauxhall was was a you know, competitor for, I guess, the, the four and a half litre Bentley. Is that, do you think that's fair? Yeah, I think it's, it was only really when uh, Vauxhall were, were bought out by GM, uh, as you say, in 1925. Um, before that, Vauxhall really were the um, competition manufacturer in England. Um, they'd, they'd won the TT on many occasions. Uh, they've held the outright hill record that shows the Walsh. Um, they with various cars at Brooklands in KN form and various others had uh, lap speed records there. And they, they really were the engineering masterpiece. Um, and had it not been for GM's purchase of Vauxhall, you know, history may well have been rewritten. Uh, Vauxhall may well have gone to to Le Mans uh, and beaten Bentley. And certainly, um, I, I'm fortunate that I've driven the, the vast majority of, of vintage Bentleys and 1398s and uh, earlier Prince Henrys. And, and in all honesty, a well sorted 1398 is a far superior car to a four and a half litre Bentley. Um, not not just in terms of performance, but in terms of it's far lighter and more nimble. Um, uh, arguably more pretty, but that's uh, beauties in the eye of the beholder. Um, but yes, Vauxhall, don't think about an Astra or um, a Vectra. You're, you're looking at an absolute beautiful machine that was the first 100 mile an hour sports car um, when it was produced. Excellent. And then to, to end with, we've got some quick far questions. So, yeah, aside from the Vauxhall 598, I think that's going to have to be excluded. Best car you've ever owned? Um, 1969 Marcos uh, three litre coupe, which had the the wooden chassis and the three litre SX Ford engine. Um, that was a hell of a hell of a good car. Yeah, I agree. I've had a 1600 GT Marcos, and they are unbelievably fun to drive and incredibly quick as well. And 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 following off that worst car ever owned. <laughs> um, I recall as a student um, buying a Mark III uh, VW Golf um, that I picked up from Glasgow train station, having sat on a train up there from London, um, and it was so appalling, I couldn't decide what was worth to endure National Rail on the way home or the Golf. And unfortunately, I chose the Golf. <laughs> that was the worst car I ever owned. <laughs> Brilliant. And then favourite circuit or hill climb? Um, favourite circuit has got to be Spa. 
it is for those people that haven't driven spa it is just electric the the mix of fast flowing corners and tricky uh complex areas um it is just fabulous and going through a rouge in any car flat is, is exhilarating um but when you get into the downforce era cars it really it's it's a terrible expression but it's different gravy it really is a, an unbelievable experience that's amazing you're, you're actually the third person we've interviewed who's brought up spa last week uh, lord hesketh he said that spa was his favorite circuit and then uh, about a month ago we had uh jillian goldsmith or as she races jillian fortsky thomas who again said that spa was one of her favorite circuits and and referred to the the old spa which had the unbelievably long section and uh she was saying that you know if you broke down there you needed some money for the bus back to the pits it was that <laughs> far away so um so there's a consistent theme there i think uh spa and the mall uh, have we been our consistent themes uh so uh next question is 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 there a classic or maybe a modern classic which you think is a currently a good buy uh, there are there are quite a few to be honest with you um the, the thing to remember at the moment is whatever you are buying try and get one that's low mileage and in original condition if you can um that that's really two tick boxes that uh, that people are after at the moment um but i i would say um bmws of the 80s and 90s uh, a, a well sorted 635 uh, is a sensible place to put your money currently um uh, or indeed uh, a uh, e30 325 cabriolet or something like that those uh, again i'm slightly fast with bmws of that period but when when you drive them they are so well sorted um good quick cars and the styling of them is just fabulous yep i agree and last question money no object one car in your garage uh has to be a c-type jaguar um just the ultimate 50 sports racer um you can drive it down to to the pub or go and do your shopping at waitrose and, and equally go and win on the circuit of the weekend it, it is the ultimate ultimate sports car yep I, I agree with you well rob thank you so much for the time there's some great great answers there and um and uh, yeah brilliant and um we really appreciate you taking the time to speak to to us on the apex no, thank you very much for the invite it's always a pleasure